morning, Grace. Thank you guys for being here with us today and experiencing that, that wonderful ceremony and how it ties in perfectly with today's sermon because we all have the charge to raise up the future generations, to, to be an example, to be a guidance for our young people, not just the, the babies that were up here today, but all of them. We have that responsibility that they see us doing what is right in the eyes of God because in 2 Kings, the one we've been going through in 1 Kings, we've seen king after king after king doing what was wrong in the sight of God, doing what is wrong in God's eyes. And so all those examples that they have were not good examples. So we are to be those examples for other people so that they see us doing what we're supposed to be doing, that we show a light and we guide them, that we lead them to Christ and we show them Christ through us and that they develop and they grow their relationship with him but we see all throughout second kings we see king after king do what was wrong in the sight of God but we are influenced by the people that we look up to some of you or not all of you are probably here today because someone influenced you in a positive way and you're here today some of you may have brought people that you were an influence to them and you were a godly influence and they're here today because of you. That's a huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. But if there's any lessons that we can take away from 2 Kings, one, idols will never lead to life. Idols will always lead to death. And the second thing, our future generations will always look up to us. Our future generations will always follow our lead. That can either be a positive lead or it could be a negative path that we lead them down. So how are we leading our children? How are we leading our coworkers? How are we leading our students, our families, our friends? It's a charge that we have. So we're going to be in chapter 16 today, but I'm, I'm going to go back and, and, and review a little bit of chapter 15. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence in this building. Father, we lift up the young people. We lift up the children. Father, just give us the strength and the courage to lead and guide and direct them in the ways that they should go. Father, help us be a positive role model for everyone around us that they see you in us, that we lead them to you that we lead them to the cross, that we lead them to your feet, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your spirit that's in this place today. Just open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to what you want us to hear today. Father, that they be your words and not mine. Speak to us individually. Father, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. So again, we're going to be in chapter 15 and 16, mostly just 16, but as I was preparing for this, you know, I was thinking the, the Olympics were, are coming up pretty soon, Summer Olympics, and I love the Olympics. You have to wait four years before you watch the Olympics, but think about the athletes. They go through all this training, all this coaching and practicing for four years for like one event, and if they're successful, great, but if they're not successful, then they have to wait another four years before they're, they're able to compete again. That's a lot of dedication. But these kings that we're talking about in, in 2 Kings, that they've been coached. They, they've been taught. They've been led. But it wasn't necessarily good coaching. It wasn't good leadership. It wasn't a good path for them to go down. But these athletes, the things that make them successful, they want to be repetitive in. Things that work, they want to keep doing it. Things that don't work, that's, they don't practice like that anymore. But they trained for four years. And that led me to a story about a, his name is Matt Amos. And you probably have never heard of him. You probably like heard of Simone Biles or, or uh, like Bruce Jenner. I don't know if that's a good one to use. But uh, let's see. Who's the Olympic swimmer? The, um, oh gosh. Yeah, Michael Phelps. See, you guys know. You know them. But Matt Emmons, who's that? Well, Matt Emmons, he was an Olympic shooter. So he shot targets with rifle. He was in the rifle competition. He was one of the best. 
He prepared and practiced for four years. And he built up so much of a lead that all he had to do to win the gold medal was just hit his target. Not score. He didn't have to hit the bullseye. All he had to do was hit his target that was emplaced in front of him. And he would be the gold medal winner. All that work, all that practice, all that coaching, it would come down to this. So he got his rifle, loaded it up, he got in position, probably took a deep breath. Maybe he held it in, maybe he exhaled slowly, I don't know. He squeezed the trigger. And he's confident that he hit his target. And he just knew he could envision that gold medal hanging around his neck. Like, I've done it. All I had to do is hit my target. All I had to do was hit it. And so they start pulling the targets back. And, and the judges come over and they're like, wait, th there's a problem. Like, there's, there's no mark on your target. He's like, there's no way I missed. There's no way I missed. And he didn't. In fact, he hit the target, just his competitor's target next to him. So not only did he not win the gold medal, but it dropped him down to like ninth place because he hit the wrong target four years down the drain. See, so his, his aim was true, right? He was confident in his abilities, but he missed his own target. He hit the wrong target. And that's how we see these kings. So the title of today's message is Hit the Right Target. See, they're, they've been coached. They've been led. They've seen these different pathways that God said, hey, worship me only. That's a, all you have to do is follow me and I will lead you. But that wasn't enough for a lot of these kings. And so they would follow and they would worship idols. And so their aim was starting to be off. And not only was their aim off, but their, their target was the wrong target. All they had to do was look to God and be obedient to him. That's all they had to do. He was their target. If they focused on him, they would be successful. If they focused on other things, unsuccessful. They lost sight of the true target. Obedience to the Lord only. They had the coaching. They had the examples to follow. But they chose to do it on their own. And like so many times, we decide to do it on our own. My aim is good enough. My direction is good enough. My choices are good enough. That will lead to destruction every time. Every time. Self leads to destruction. So these kings were looking for the wrong target when it was right in front of them the entire time. Hitting the right target. So let's look at some of these kings in chapter 15. So if you have your, your note-taking Bible, you can kind of follow along there. But I'm, not, I'm just going to hit just a little bit because they all did what was wrong. So. But Zechariah, he did evil in God's sight. Shocker. Because he did evil in God's sight, he had the reign of six months. It's a long time. Then his reign, he was murdered by Shalom. Then Shalom took over. He did what was evil in God's sight. See this pathway that they're on? Did evil what was in God's sight? The next king's going to do what's evil in God's sight? They were losing sight of their target. So Shalom, he was rewarded with a reign of an entire month. He was in charge an entire month. So it kind of makes you wonder why anybody would want to be king over Israel, over the northern kingdom. Because remember, they're split at this time. Why would anyone want king to be king? So he was killed by Menahem. And he was even worse. Menahem, he was ruthless. He did what was evil in the sight of God. And then some. He enslaved people. He killed people. He took over lands. In one part of the scripture, it says he took the pregnant women of unborn babies and slashed them open. Appropriate for our ceremony today, right? The wrong kind of sacrifice. 
See, their, 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 their aim was so off, their, their target was totally wrong. They thought they were doing right. Nothing could be further from the truth. He took money from the people. He made the nation weaker and weaker and weaker because he was doing what he thought was right. He thought his aim was true, but it was off. Bad. He was afraid. See, fear makes us do some incredible things sometimes. Then we get to Pekahiah, his son. And you would think that he would learn his lesson. He didn't. So he reigned for two years. He did not learn from his father's mistakes. He didn't learn from previous king's mistakes. And he kept aiming at the wrong target as well. And he was killed by Pekah, the leader of his own army. The person that was supposed to protect him, this person that was supposed to be by his side, killed him. So Pekah, you think, well, he's going to be a good leader. He is not. He missed a true target for 20 years. And most of his kingdom was lost to Assyria because it was so weak by the previous kings. And he was killed. But chance after chance after chance, these kings had an opportunity just to focus on God, just to follow God, just to be obedient to the Lord like they were supposed to. And time and time again, they thought, I'm just going to do it on my own. That my practice is good enough. That my, my preparation is good enough. I'm good enough on my own. They were selfish. And it brought destruction. All they had to do was listen to the prophets. They were showing them the way. But they would rather worship and serve these little G-gods. And idol worship leads to death every time. It's not going to save you. There's no little God out there that can save you. There's no idol that can save you. There's only one true God that can save you. And you think, well, that's it's not always easy to do, is it? It's not always easy just to focus on God. Things get hard. Things get tough. You go through some rough patches in your life. And you think, well, you, it's easy to just focus. It's not. Because those bad things happen, those situations come up. And you start to rely on other things more than you rely on God. It's easier to look at the world, what they're doing, to satisfy that hunger or to to solve that problem. You start to self-medicate or you start to look to other things. And you start building up your high places. And you start to serve these idols when you should be aiming and looking toward God. When it gets hard, when it gets tough, it's not always easy to do. We so, we so focus on ourselves. See, even the kings of Judah, even the kings that were supposed to be doing what is right in God's eyes, even they messed up. They tried to do what was right. So that leads us to Uzziah. He's the son of Amaziah. He reigned for 52 years. So we can see if these kings are doing what is right in God's eyes, if they're doing what God wants them to do, they have a pretty long reign. He did right in God's eyes, but. A couple weeks ago, Teresa's message is be the butt. This one, you don't want to be the butt. It says, nevertheless, the high places were not removed. See, even these kings that were doing right in God's eyes, nevertheless, the high places were not removed. These high places were miniature temples that, that people would put up. They would sacrifice to other gods. Sometimes they would sacrifice the actual one true God, but that's, it wasn't the place it, it was designed to be. The temple was there for to God to dwell with them and to be with them, to be a light and guidance and direction. And they set these high places. And so these kings would get rid of all the idols and get rid of all the idol worship, but yet they would leave a remnant. They would leave a few things. And see, that's like the church today. We do this in our own lives. We try to follow God, but we put other things on pedestals that we shouldn't put up. And we start to accept things that we shouldn't accept. We start to put our own rituals in there and our own ideas. And we start to build up these high places. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, not to God. Not to God. Nevertheless. See, this is selfishness. And selfishness leads to sin. And so much so that Chronicles tells us that he made himself a priest, Uzziah, because he he became so successful. 
He was doing what was right in God's eyes. And this can be like us sometimes. Things can be so, going so well. God can be blessing us and blessing us. And then instead of thanking God for those blessings, what happens? Our pride starts to grow. And then it doesn't become about God. It becomes about me. Uzziah made himself a priest, which was against what God wanted him to do. It was not for him at all. Just so he could, he started trusting God, and God helped him, and he built him up. But he didn't learn the lesson. He left the high places. But the more obedient he was to God, the more he built, he built him up. And so that pride started to infiltrate his life. And because of that pride, because Uzziah made it more and more about him, look what I've done, look what, look what I'm doing. Instead of what God's done for me, look what I'm doing. God punished him by giving him leprosy. And he lived the rest of his life in isolation. He went from someone that had everyone around him. Anyone he wanted to be around him, they would be there. He had all kinds of servants. He had a huge army that would want to be around him. His family. He went from all of that to living in isolation. He was alone. He was desolate. That's where idol worship will take you. That's where pride will take you. Is isolation away See, his aim was good. He could see that gold medal around his neck. It's like, that's going so well. And it started to be more and more about him until he was aiming at the wrong target altogether. He was missing the target. See, his target was supposed to be solely on the Lord. And it became more and more about him. It became more and more about him. And it led to destruction. Pride and selfishness was his downfall. So that leads us to his son, Jotham. He ruled for 15 years. And he also did what was right in the eyes of God. Just like his father. But just like his father, nevertheless, he left the high places. The high places were not removed. See, they're starting to not only lead the nation into idol worship. They didn't take them out. And we can be, if we're not careful, the church can be like that too. That we can start accepting some things and, and putting some high places over here and making rituals over here. And that gets us further and further away from God instead of closer to him. Instead of true worship to Christ. So that leads us to the main character today. And that's King Ahaz. In chapter 16. And we think, well, he's got to be better. No. It just gets worse gets worse. He loses sight of his aim, of his target, and everything. We're going to start in verse 1 today. It says, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz, Ahaz was twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of God. He did not do what was right as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering. It's kind of the opposite of what we did this morning, right? According to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. See, Ahaz was way out of God's will. And being out of God's will makes you sacrifice things that you shouldn't sacrifice. It makes you sacrifice the wrong things in life. Ahaz, because he saw all the good things that the Assyrians were doing, all the good things that the Canaanites were doing. See, they, they were weaker. And he's like, if these gods and these idols help the Assyrians and help the Canaanites, I've got to adopt that too. They're better than our God. And so he sacrifices his own son to the God Melech. Now, I want to, I, I can't leave here without giving you the picture of what's going on here. So if you've got younger kids, you might want to hold their ears. But this God Melech, it was a huge statue, metal, probably made of bronze or, or whatever they had. But that would heat this statue up so that 
they would place the baby on the outstretched arms of Moloch, the statue, and it being red hot. And as soon as the baby touched those arms, it would burn to death. They would beat drums in order to drown out the cries of the child. And so the significant thing is we, we dedicated these babies today to the Lord, that we lead and we guide and direct them, right? The Israelites, they're, they were supposed to offer a sacrifice to their firstborn as a burnt offering, not sacrificing them literally. So this was going against God's plan because the death angel passed over them in Egypt. So they were supposed to make offerings for their firstborn. Ahaz is like, I'm going to, st- I'm going to cut out the middleman. I'm just going to sacrifice my own son. How far they have fallen. How bad their aim was off. They don't even know what target they're shooting for. It has gotten that bad. But being out of God's will makes you sacrifice things that you should not sacrifice. It gets worse. See, we sacrifice the wrong things. See, we think we're sharp. We think we know what we're doing. Until we start sacrificing our time away from God. And we start sacrificing our time away from our family. We start sacrificing our families because it's about ourself. We think, oh, I just want to get out of that situation. And you start sacrificing your family. Or you sacrifice your money. You start sacrificing the wrong things when you're out of God's will. But you stop to truly trust in Him. So we start to sacrifice those idols in our life that we built up, that we think is better, because it makes us feel better at that moment. And we lose focus, we lose sight on Jesus, we lose sight on God that we need to lean on for protection. When life gets hard, when life gives us problems, that we don't look to those idols, that we don't go to those high places, that we turn to Him, we turn to our, our target. The true target and not sacrificing things that we shouldn't sacrifice. But idol worship comes from pride. It comes from fear. It's all about you. It's all about me. It's when you're fully, when you're so afraid that you cannot fully trust in God. That my problem is too, it's too big for God. That my, my situation, I've, I've got to have some more help. God's not, God's not listening to me. He's not answering my prayer in, in the time that I think he should answer it. So we start to go to other things. We start to go to that idol worship because we're afraid. Or we start to go to that because we're prideful. Just like Uzziah, he was prideful. Ahaz, he was prideful, then he was fearful. It's a deadly combination. And he starts to look to other ways. That idol worship is from pride. It's from fear. Verse 5, it says, Now then, Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to wage war on Jerusalem, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. At that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, recovered Elath, or Syria, and drove out the men of Judah from Elath. And the Edomites came to Elath, where they dwell to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant. I am your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria, from the hand of the king of Israel, who are attacking me. It's like Assyria, I'm, I'm being attacked from all directions. Rescue me. I will be your son. I will be your servant. Ahaz also took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and set a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it, carrying its people captive to Kit. And he also killed Rezin. I don't know if you caught that. But as evil as Ahaz was, as bad as he was, He was not conquered. God was still protecting Ahaz. He did not deserve it. But God keeps his promises. That that was God's people. 
Ahaz was doing all these horrible things, yet God did not let him be conquered. That's such good news for the state because we serve a God that is so compassionate and so grace-filled that even though that we do bad things, even though we don't always walk and do what's right in his sight, he is gracious to us, and we still don't fully rely on him. We still have our high places. We still have our idols. And here we have Ahaz seeing this. He says, I am your son. I, I am your servant. So basically adopt me. I, I'm going to be in your family. I wanna, I'm going to be an Assyrian. You, you, you're, you guys are so strong. We're so weak. Our God's not helping us. And not only that, he, he enslaved his entire people because of it. He's like, here, take all the, take all the money in the country. Take all, take all the treasures. It's yours. Just, just protect us. Take me, take my people, rescue me from the Syrians, rescue from my enemies. See, can you imagine if he would just prayed that prayer to God? If he would just went to the target to begin with, if he just went to the true source to start with, saying, God, I am your servant. We are your people. I am your son. Protect us. He did not let him be conquered. Could you imagine how it would have been different? Could you imagine how your life would be different if you would just go to the source at the beginning? When your problems start to get hard, that you stay in God, that you stay in His will, that you stay obedient to Him, that you don't look to other things to satisfy yourself. See, it leads to destruction. It leads to death. God would have protected him. If he just said, God, I am your son. God, I am your servant. Protect us. He would have answered him. But instead, he robs the temple. He robs God. He robs his own people to give it to the Assyrians for protection. This supposedly godly king is now a pagan king with a pagan people because we influence the people around us. And they, the people, you would have thought someone would have said, hey, let's, let's back up a minute. Why are we sacrificing our, our kids? Why are we killing our kids to a God that doesn't really exist? Why are we sacrificing the idols that don't belong? We know the one true God. We know the God of all creation. Why don't we follow him? No, it's because we influence the people around us. And we're going to either influence them in a positive way. We're either going to lead them to Christ or we're going to lead them away. Ahaz was leading his people away from God. He begins to worship the wrong God. He captured their worship. He captured their identity. See, the same can be true today, that we can, we can rob the church of its true worship by adding things that don't belong. That we think we can achieve victory without work, without worshiping the one true God. We're prideful. Sometimes we think that we can solve our own problems and solve the world's problems by serving the gods of Damascus. And it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Our useless rituals and the differences that we make up only lead people further away. See, Ahaz served as a priest of his own design. Of his own design. So he goes up and tears out the temple. Let's finish up 10 through 20. So when King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet tiglath pileser king of Assyria, he saw the altar that was in Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah, the priest, a model of the altar and its pattern, exact to all its details. And Uriah, the priest, built the altar, built the altar in accordance with all that the king Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah, the priest, made it before king Ahaz arrived from Damascus. So he went before him. He built this out of the model, just like he wanted it. Verse 12, And when the king came from Damascus, the king viewed the altar. Then the king drew near the altar and went up on it, and burnt his burnt offering and his grain offering, and poured his drink offering, and threw the blood of the peace offerings on the altar. And the bronze altar that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between, 
his altar in the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of his altar. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, On the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering and the king's burnt offering and all the other offerings and throw it all in the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice. But the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Uriah the priest did all this as King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the frames of the stands and removed them from the basin from them and took them down to see from off the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a stone pedestal. And he covered the way for the Sabbath that had been built inside the house in the outer entrance of the king. For the king, he caused to go around the house of the Lord because the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts that Ahaz did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. A lot to unpack there. See, in his disobedience, he takes the temple that was designed brick by brick. Everything was designed and placed there by God to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, the, a place for them to go to offer sacrifices for the people to God. It th- was designed exactly the way God intended. Perfect blueprints. And because Ahaz was so prideful and so fearful, he started to build up his own altar. He saw this altar in, in Damascus, and he's like, he's watching too much HDTV. He's like, I've got to have that. I've got to, I've got to change this altar. I've, I've got to change God. And so he sends her eyes like, hey, build this for me. And it was built before he even got back. So he took something that God had built, that God had placed there on purpose, for a purpose, and he started to rebuild it in his own design. He started to tear down what God had already built up. He was tearing it down. And we too get sometimes that desperate that we start to tear down the things in our life that God has built up in our lives and we start to tear that down. That we tear down what God is already starting to build up in our disobedience. Sometimes we, we tear down the people around us. God puts a person in our life to help us through a situation. We don't want them. We start to tear them down. We start to go in the opposite direction. We start to lose focus. We start to aiming in different directions. We lose focus of the target that was set before us. He has lost sight of the temple. He lost sight of what it represented. He lost sight of the one true God. And he starts to tear it down and to build up his own altar, to build his own temple, to build up his own life. And the people are just letting this happen. The people aren't stopping it. See, people are going to follow in our footsteps. People look up to us. People are going to follow us. See, we're going to either lead them to the right target or we're going to take them away from the right target. Where we've stripped away the true worship of Christ and we start to replace it by pagan gods and rituals. But nevertheless... Nevertheless, the last point is finish well. Finish well. That it's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's like the Olympics. It's not their preparation, it's not their practice, it's where they finish. And say it's like Matt Emmons. You would think that he would just given up. And he probably had that, th- that thought to just give up. And after that Olympics, after that debacle, he was in a restaurant. And he was probably drowning in his sorrows. And thinking, what, what am I going to do now? Four years down the drain. I've got to wait another four years. And as he was there sulking and having a pity party, 
he met his wife. And then he goes on to train more in the next Olympics. He wins a gold medal and he wins another medal. See, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's how you finish that matters. And where we need to finish is at the feet of Jesus. See, all of us came in here in a different place in our life. You came in here with, with problems, you came in here with trials, you, you came in here with temptations. And it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And where we need to finish is at the temple. We finish at the feet of Jesus. See, all of us at one time were sinners. That's where we all started out, and we still are there. But it's not where we start, it's where we finish. And we finish at the feet of Jesus, we finish with victory. Finish at the feet of Jesus. Matthew 12, 6 says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here. Matthew 26 said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and then rebuild it in three days. Jesus is saying, I am the temple. Jesus says, I am your target. Keep your aim, keep your sight on me. I am the target. You can look to wherever you want to look to. You can look to the world. You can look to the, the shiny things that are put in front of you that lead to destruction every time. Or you can keep your focus, you can keep your aim on Jesus and hit the target. Hit the true target. Go to his feet. In Revelation 21, it says, I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God Almighty. The temple is the Lord. The temple is the Lamb. The temple is Jesus. And the final scripture says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Well, we are the temple. You and I, Christ in our hearts, we, we are the temple. And we can either bring people closer to Christ. We can either bring people to Christ. We can bring people to the temple of God. Or we can take them away. We can push them away. We can lead them in the, in the wrong direction. But lead them to his feet. Show them the true target. The temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make a dwelling with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is who we are. God in our hearts. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You are a temple. The temple is here, and you are the temple. Be the Christ for people. Bring them to his feet. Show them the true target. See, we're, we're, not, we're not worthy of such a sacrifice. We're all dirty. We're all broken. We're a fallen people. And all too often, we lose sight of the target. But God loves us. He has that much grace for us. And it says, come back. Come back to me. Follow me. See, we're not worthy, but nevertheless, Christ died on a cross for each and every one of us. Bring them in. Start, quit aiming at the wrong target. Quit trying to do it on your own. Lean on God. Don't lean on the high places you build up. Don't lean on the, the idols that you place. Those will lead to death and destruction every time. Jesus is the temple. Lay them at his feet. Lay them at his feet. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for these lessons of these kings that we see an example of what not to do. Father, just give us the courage and give us, thank you for the charge that you put in our lives that we're supposed to lead and guide and direct our young people, our co-workers, our students, our friend groups, that we show them the way, that we show them the right target to be aiming for. 
Father, the world shows and the world gives people all different kinds of targets and it's the wrong ones. Those idols and those high places, those rituals, those things that we think are going to help us just lead to destruction. They lead to pain. They lead to sorrow. Give us the strength and the courage to give you our problems, to give you our trials. The people that we're praying for would help us show them the true target. And that true target is you. And it's not where we begin, it's where we finish. And where we finish is at your feet. We had Brother David's celebration of life service yesterday. And it's not where he starts. See, his life was full of good times. It was full of bad times. Some things he did right, some things he did wrong, just like everyone else. But he had Christ as a Savior. He had sight of the true target. And it's not where he started, it's where he finished. And where he finished is at home in heaven for eternity. That's the same place that we finish. Father, if there's anyone here that does not know you, as their personal Savior. Father, all they have to do is confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are Lord and that you died for them and that you were raised on the third day, that you shed your blood for them to cover their sins. Father, don't let anyone leave out of here except if they, can, if they leave out better than when they came in. Father, Help us lead others to you. Help us show them the true target. And that is you and only you. In your name we pray. Amen.